Welcome everybody to History's Calling, Where Will It Take You? Joining us today, we have Tyler King. Tyler, welcome. Thank you for having me. Tyler, I was hoping you, we could get started by you sharing with us who you are and what brings you to this webinar series today. Yeah, yeah. So uh, like Lindsay said, my name is Tyler King. Uh, currently, I am the Senior Social Media Manager at Bamboo HR. Uh, Bamboo HR, we are the number one uh, HR software for small and medium-sized businesses. And so I get it. Everyone thinks of HR and they think of Toby from the office and everybody hates Toby. And so that's one of the, of the more fun parts of my job to help people realize HR is not the bad guy. That really um, HR is meant to really help companies grow from good to great and to have make sure that companies um, have an amazing company culture. And that's what gets me really excited. And um, I love being a part of the marketing team here. Um, a little bit more about me, kind of my journey, where I've come from and everything like that. Um, so let's see, we'll go back to the beginning. Usually I tell this when I'm like doing interviews, they always ask me, well, Tyler, you're in marketing, but we see here that you are a, a history major. Like what happened with that? And so I'll do my best to uh, give you the condensed version, but still with, with some fun details. So I've always loved history. Um, I'm an Air Force kid. And so I moved all over the place and I lived in England for three years when my dad was stationed there. And England is just one big giant island of history. And um, I lived in an old school. I mean, my cafeteria at school was an old bomber hangar in World War II. I mean, so like it was just everywhere. And so that's where I really fell in love with history. And I just would read all the books and I would watch all the movies and the TV shows. The History Channel and I were really good friends. Um, got to college, like a lot of people at BYU, had one year be before my mission and just took, you know, generals and things like that. And I'm always pleased to tell people that I aced American heritage, uh, <laughs> which is really conceited now, but hey, you know, I did. But then got back from my mission uh, from in Indiana and I was like, well, okay, it's real lifetime now. What do I do? And I remember talking to people and they always would say, you know, what do you enjoy doing? Like, what's not any work for you? Like, what, what, what do you find yourself doing naturally? And I was like, well, history. And I've always loved teaching. I've always loved, you know, that aspect of really helping people and guiding people and inspiring people. And I thought, well, sounds like I need to be a history major to be a, a professor. And so jumped in, got into the history department at, at BYU, um, kept my... Um, minor in comms and advertising because I really enjoyed that as well but I thought no history is for me like I'll I'll stick with that so let's see of course this is all as I started as I started to graduate it was like 2009 2010 so the height of the great recession so job prospects were not good and I thought well it's okay I'm going to be a history professor so it's going to be great uh, worked with my professors, did all my applications, applied to like six schools, did the whole shebang, got, got them all in the mail, and I just waited thinking, awesome, this is going to be great, I'm going to be able to pick from all these different schools, I'm going to go to like these cool places, it, it's going to be awesome. That didn't happen. In fact, I got no's across the board, and I got some like not very nice no's either. Like, why did you even bother applying? And this is not for you. And yeah, so there I am, 2009, I have a brand new baby, trying to graduate during the height of the Great Recession. Grad school is not an option for history. And I thought, well, man, what do I do? And so I was working in the library at the time in, in the social sciences section. So in between helping people research, I was just applying for any job that I could find. And I was interviewing and I was going up against like 45 year old adults for these positions because, because you know, times were just so tough then. And I just thought, well, got to trust in the plan, trust that Heavenly Father knows what we need to do. And um, got a, finally got a job offer for selling cars at Larry H. Miller in Provo. And everyone told me, don't do it, don't do it. Like, you don't wanna sell cars because this was also right during Cash for Clunkers. And for all you young kids who have no idea what that is, just Google <laughs> it. Uh, it was a thing, I can't even, it, long story short. Anyway, the car buying business wasn't great either. 
but I was like, I got a baby. I have a family. Like I have to do something. I can't, I mean, BYU at the time was like kicking out all the seniors because there were so many of us that were trying to like ride out the recession in college. Cause I was making more money in college than I would have been making out of college. So anyway, it was just a perfect storm of craziness. And I got this job and it actually turned out to be like one of the most pivotal moments of my love, my professional life. Uh, when you think of car sales, you think of sleazy people who are like just there to make a buck, there to do anything they can to trick you and stuff like that. But it actually turned out I had two of the best bosses I have ever had. They took me in, they mentored me, they saw the skills that I had that I was really good at the, you know, figuring out what stories people want to know when they buy a car. Because when you buy a car, you're Yes, you're buying the wheels and the engine and stuff, but you're really buying the story behind that car. And that was something in history that that's all I did for four years was find these unique stories, prove an argument, you know, persuasive writing, things like that. So that was, you know, a natural segue that I didn't even think of. But it was interesting, too. Like I I did pretty well in the car selling, but my boss was like, Tyler, the sales part, that's not your jam marketing, advertising, connecting with people, like that's what you need to do. And they guided me and kind of gave me all kinds of advice and pointers. And uh, they encouraged me to apply for grad school, but this time in communications. So I was like, I was a little gun shy. I was like, I don't know if I want to go to this again. It's number one, it's expensive to apply to, to grad school. And I'm here, I am a young kid, just barely making any money. But I prayed about it and I was thinking, okay, what can I do? And so I applied to BYU's comms program and I got in. And I was like, what? This is crazy. And so that started, you know, going from selling cars. And then I worked uh, for BYU. I worked for uh, the Utah Flash. They were uh, the D-League basketball team at the time for the Utah Jazz. And I just jumped into marketing and I had to just figure it out on my own. And I was, you know, going through Google, watching YouTube's. This was also 2009, 2010. So like Facebook and Twitter were just barely a thing. And I remember I worked for the, I applied for a job at BYU in the Washington seminar to to run their social media. And I think the statute of limitations is over on this, but lying is too strong of a word to say how I got that job. I would say (laughs) I... I sold it well that I that I could do it that I could run social for this program and, and I didn't really have tons of experience besides the selling cars and I you know using the internet to do that but I got it and that was a great crash course and so long story short you know that was my first foray was working in social at BYU and I loved it I loved the idea of people don't want just billboards people don't want to be sold to people like to connect with a company and understand that that company understands me and finding those stories and finding those unique ways to have that two-way form of communication. I thought that was just awesome. And it really spoke to me. And so ever since I got that job at BYU, I uh, just was like, okay, what other things do I lack? And I just had to just build my skill sets one job at a time. And I learned a lot, failed a lot. And, uh, about five years ago, I got the shop at Bamboo, which has just completely changed my life as well because it's the best place I, I've ever worked. And if you would have told me five and a half years ago that my best place of working was an HR software company, I'd be like, mm, yeah, not so much. But mm-hmm. it's fantastic from our culture, our values, our mission, um, what we try to do to help people, set people free to do great work. It's just been fantastic. So. That was a lot of talking, but that was a lot of just words. But yeah, that's uh, that's kind of where, how I got to where I am today. Well, thank you so much. First of all, I'm sold on Bamboo HR. It's too bad I'm not in a position where I can implement that into my current role. But yeah, talk about sales and talk about your communication skills. That's dead on. I'm, I'm really curious. Um, you said a couple of things that I wanted to go back to. Yeah. I love... First of all, I love that you are very clear that there were some priorities in your life that took precedent when it came to brass tacks, that you had a family that you needed to take care of. And so you relied on these other accessible strengths that you had. 
And then along this journey, you had mentors that were able to help point that out in you and say, yeah. actually, we find that you're really good over here. Can you talk through maybe mentoring and what the value of mentorship when it comes to really evaluating qualifications and really evaluating skill sets? Because I think that's maybe something that's missing in the student uh, conversation. A lot of the times you say, yeah. okay, you can go and find these things inherent within yourself, but sometimes it's nice to have a third party lens. So can you talk to, yeah. talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think a mentor is a great resource because you, that relationship starts with just you and them. You don't have all of the extra stuff that, you know, we bring to relationships with our family, with our spouses, with close friends they just see you just as who you are in that very professional sense. And so I think that allows them to see strengths and skills that sometimes your family or your friends or your school church leaders or whatever the case may be, not necessarily see because they also know you for all your faults and for all the mistakes that, that you've made and, and, and things of like, and things of that nature and your mentor, it's in their best interest to see you succeed because they want you to help you grow. And the best bosses have that coach mentality. And same, and same with mentors, where the more that you succeed, I mean, that's just a win for them and it's, and it's a win for everybody. And that's something that I've always tried to seek out when I have applied to new jobs or whatever I've tried to, you know, um, try new experiences. Your mentor slash boss is key. And that doesn't mean that you're going to be best buds for life. And you're going to go have barbecues together and, you know, things of like that. But having someone there who you know and trust and that can see the potential that you have because they've helped other people do it. I mean, that's amazing. Like going back to my bosses selling cars, um, two of them, you know, Kevin and, and Shane, you know, they were, they've been in the car business forever. And so they could definitely see, okay, what skills Tyler have? people skills, communication skills, um, you know, that marketing side of things. Sales, he can do, but that wasn't my passion. That wasn't something that really got me up every day really excited because there's nothing worse than, you know, being a car salesman and going out there and people are coming into the building and immediately their defenses come up and they're like, I hate you because you're a dirty car salesman. And so that's less, so that isn't great for the old uh, self-esteem. But uh, my bosses, you know, Shane and Kevin were able to see past all that, see past, you know, all the failed job attempts I had before. They were able to see past me not getting into grad school. And they were able to just kind of see for who I am. And they were able to, to test me. And they were able to push me in ways that I, that I didn't really understand at the time. And now looking back, I'm like, ah, that was a method to their madness. And that's something too, I find, you know, even with my current boss, Amanda, she's fantastic. And she's did a great job of finding my strengths, but also pointing out, okay, here's where you can work on some things. And that's one thing that we can't be afraid of is um, being open to that feedback. We have to be able to humble ourselves, to know that we're not perfect. We're not always the best at everything. I tell, I tell this to my kids all the time now. You can't be perfect at something that you're just starting out at. It's impossible, unless you're like LeBron James or, but even then, he still had to work at basketball just a little bit. But <laughs> um, we got to be able to, you know, look at our own film. That's kind of a, a mentality that I've been having lately is getting that feedback allows us to review the tape and to know where we succeeded and to know where we need and where we need some work. And that's okay. And the best mentors help you see that. They build you up but they also at the same time can point out where you need to work on some things. And that's something that I tell, you know, all my cousins who are younger, who are in college, just starting out, or, you know, younger people at Bamboo. I'm old now, I'm in my late thirties. And so people are, think I'm super old. And it's weird when my intern's like 22 and she doesn't understand any of my cultural references, but still, <laughs> it's, uh, it's important to, to understand that mentorship is just so important uh, to start now to be able to be able to find those people. Yeah. Thank you so much for talking about that. I think that that's something that's a very underutilized here at the university as well, right? So you, you had your mentors in right after you graduated in that first role. And I'm sure you had mentors while you were here at school too. So 
maybe you can talk a little bit about what are some other things that you would suggest for our students to do to help open up those future opportunities? Because the future opportunity that I'm seeing here is that there were people in your life that saw these skills and you said, okay, great, I'm going to take this advice and I'm just going to run with it, see what happens, gain where I need to gain, fail where I need to fail. So what other things did you do as an undergrad or even as a graduate student that helped open up other possibilities for you? Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Um, I think in my undergrad, I reached out, I had some key professors who I really trusted and they were awesome and they were really supportive, but they were kind of stuck as well because things just weren't built then to help history majors outside of law and uh, going on to grad school. So they helped a lot with like helping me in, in, in that role. But then I was like, I just feel like there's more that I can do. And I just was, I just went up and just went to the business school. And I was like, they got to know what's, what's going on. They're always placing people. The Tanner, you know, building is always full of all these fancy cars. They have to know what's, what's going on. And, uh, you know, they had a little bit fancier cars than we had. Uh, I guess it really, it really isn't in a history, at least when I was there, it wasn't really, I guess the JFSB now is, but now I'm getting sidetracked. But um, yeah, so I went to the, to the business school and I went to their career development. And I said, here I am, I'm a history major. What can I do? And they're the ones that also pointed me to, you know, to open my mind to what I could do. Like if it's sales, give it a try. If it's, you know, these things you may not understand, like it's okay, just get in the door. And sometimes half the battle is just figuring out what you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. And that was something that was tough at, you know, to figure out because none of us like to fail at anything. But if you look at it from that, that standpoint of, well, I know sales isn't for me but I really like the marketing. I really like the advertising side of it. You know, let's go that way. And I think sometimes, you know, Heavenly Father has a role for all of us when it comes to our career, but at the same time, we got to be able to take that leap. And even if we don't know where it's going to end up and like, mm -hmm. that's, trust me, you know, to everyone who doesn't understand uh, the great recession, it was not a good time to be trying to find a, a job when you're going up against like 45 year olds for entry level positions but it all worked out and it was scary and it was hard and it was terrifying, but I'm so glad that every single job I've had since then has led me to not, I mean, not just bamboo and I, I love it here, but you know, the skills that I have now where I feel comfortable applying to director level positions and to be able to learn more about comms, and PR and product marketing and things like that, things that I didn't even know existed 11 years ago when, when I graduated. And I, I love uh, being able to look at experiences like that and realize that any experience is not a wasted experience, no, right? No, going in there, doing the best that you can do, you know, learning from it and coming out of it with, oh, like you said, five years ago, I never would have thought that it was going to be, you know, an HRIT company. And yeah, yeah. you are, right? So I, just the value of that experiential learning. And I think that that's, you know, part of what we're trying to help students understand is the more you can go out and experience all these different things, whether or not it's the trajectory of history or whether or not it's history in business or whether or yeah. not it's, you know, IT or whatever it is, those experiences are going to help no matter what. Yeah. So I, I really yeah. value that. Thanks. Oh, for sure. So can you tell us a little bit, you talked about how, finding stories was something that was really compelling, especially compelling in the work that you do now, right? Because we, I, I have a PR background too, and, and using stories and, and helping build that connection with stories is a, a huge and, and important part of marketing and public relations. Can you tell us about other things that maybe you garnered um, as a history student that contribute to the work that you do now? Yeah, oh, for sure. I just saw... Uh... A great tweet from a fellow marketer here. He's like, if I would have known after college that most of my life would just be writing, <laughs> I would have paid a lot more attention in school. And I feel that at like a deep level. Um, history helped me so much in just being able to write. Um, 
it sounds really dumb maybe, but like being, a, being able to write cohesive, concise, engaging emails is huge for your career. Uh, being able to create presentations that are visually and also stylistically, you know, engaging is massive. And then in my career too, uh, think about it like for a tweet, you have 240 characters to tell a story that will allow people to, as they scroll, and we all do, either on TikTok or Twitter or Instagram, or whatever the case may be, we're always constantly scrolling. You have three seconds to catch people's attention. And that's just a thesis statement that you write on every single history paper. And so I realized, oh, tweets are just thesis statements. And that's, and that was because I was pretty scared in the beginning, like, how am I going to write for this? And I realized, no, let's just break it down to what you know. And um, so the writing was huge. That is such a you know key part to what I do. And in business and whatever you do, writing is something that will always be a key component to how you advance in your career. So um, I also teach social media for BYU-Idaho and I always tell my students, practice, practice, practice when it comes to writing. Like it's okay if someone comes in and edits and edits you, that's fine. Like we, we have, that's just one thing that just takes time and effort to get better at. So writing is huge. Um, what else? Uh, let's see, I lost train of thought, I got it back. Um, writing proposals for marketing campaigns. So every marketing campaign that you see starts number one with, with an idea. You think, oh, that's cool. But it's to actually make that marketing campaign come to fruition. It has to be more than just a cool idea. You have to put an argument together about why this specific idea is gonna help you achieve your goals. And those goals are going to be different depending upon if it's for product marketing or customer marketing or for a recruiting campaign. And all those are, it turns out to be, are just research papers. Finding an argument, supporting your argument, making your case, and then, you know, being persuasive in your writing. And so I've had a few bosses kind of tell me like, hey, like, you're pretty good at this. And I'm like, I know, that's all I did for four years. <laughs> um, an interesting thing, though, that's important to remember, um, academic writing is a little bit different than business writing. Academic writing, they like you to take your time sometimes, give a lot of detail, a lot of, you know, a lot of extra stuff. Business, not so much. I've actually had to get that feedback, too, where a lot of times it was like, Tyler, just get to the point. Make it snappy, make it compelling, but you, you gotta, you gotta wrap this thing up and get to the point. And so that's also one thing that I've had to learn as well. So that's, that's, that's an important thing to, to keep an eye out for. But yeah, I think those two are the main things that I've really learned that just dovetailed perfectly from history into my career in, in marketing. That's so great. And I'm so glad you're saying that because I think that that's a really hard thing for a lot of our students to understand is the connection between, no, really, these things that we're developing in your coursework will help you. I mean, even yeah. though you had to work on being snappy and more concise and more compelling, you didn't have to learn the rules right. of, you know, sentence structure and of, you know, persuasion as much. You studied yeah. that. So yeah. that's really great. And even I hated this at the time when I was an undergrad and grad, like your work cited, you think you'll never use that ever again. No, I use it all the time because you got to find those sources that's not just Wikipedia, to support your campaign and your initiative and what you want to do. So yeah, even work cited is something that I still use today. Whoa, do you hear that, students? I know. That's why know. we spend so much time on it in our classes. I hated it. I feel you. I get it, everybody. <laughs> like, it's so annoying. And I got so mad, like my commas were in the wrong place or it was the wrong indentation. And so that kind of stuff, you may, you may not need, but the ability to find and vet sources is something that I use every day. And that's all coming from my days as a history major. I love that, thank you for that. So Tyler, as we kind of wrap up our conversation today, I was wondering if you could help our students know, what do you suggest for students to be prepared for internships or entry level positions at a company like yours yeah, offering yeah. similar services? 
like I just mentioned, we just hired um, our first social intern and she's from BYU and she's fantastic, but, and she's from the business department. But when I was looking at people to evaluate, I didn't care what degree they had because I'm not a business major. And so I wouldn't, you know, so I always make sure that I don't, that's not, you know, a key consideration for me. Um, your resume and everything like that needs to be really compelling and show me not just like what you've done, but what did you solve? What have you tried to do on your own? Show me the problems, show me the solutions. That's a big thing for marketing. We all have problems that we need to solve, but what did you do to, to solve them? I think too, I love to see hustle. I love to see, you know, especially in marketing and social media and things like that. Like sometimes you gotta just go and make things happen. And even if it's not the most prestigious thing that you did, if it was just helping your uncle or your aunt or whatever the case may be, just to see that you're trying to make something happen, I think shows tremendous ability because I, I can teach marketing. I can teach you social stuff, but the hustle, the curiosity, the problem solving, stuff like that, like that's harder to teach. And so that's, that's stuff that I like to look for as well. That's so great. Thank you so much for telling us different things that will help our students be prepared to do. I have a lot of students that are interested in human resources. I have a lot of students yeah. interested in IT. I have a lot of students interested in, you know, where can this degree take me? So do you have any other advice for our students that you think, I really need to make sure that I leave them with this? Hmm. That's a good question. I think one thing to remember in all of this as you are you know, nearing graduation or, or wherever you are in your undergrad, number one, you don't have to have everything figured out, but start with what you know, what do you enjoy doing? And then making sure that you talk to different people to kind of understand, okay, where do my skills meet with these different job recommendations? And you may discover, yeah, marketing fits for you. You may discover HR. And it was so nice now within the church and with BYU, we have such a vast network of people that are so willing to talk and to be able to kind of give you their perspective. I love helping people understand, you know, where they fit and what skills they have and, you know, what directions that they, what that they can go. And you got to just ask, you got to get out there and you have to, you know, honestly now with LinkedIn and with Twitter and things like that, you have so much access to people. And it may take a few times. You know, I, mean, I don't know if I would go straight to Oprah to uh, get career advice, but who am I to maybe she would get back to you. But especially here in Utah, especially with some awesome SaaS companies that we have, a lot of homegrown companies, especially from BYU founders. I mean, our, our CEO and co-founders are all BYU grads. They all want to help. And so, but don't just reach out and say, hey, tell, tell me what to do. Again, come with, Here's my problem. Here's some solutions that I, I've been thinking. What do you think? And nine times out of 10, people are more than willing to help out. Well, thank you so much, Tyler, for your time. We're so excited about the growth that we're seeing with Bamboo HR. And yeah. a lot of it can be attributed to the, the awareness building that is happening over there. And so yeah. thank you so much for joining us today. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure to talk to you today.